Huzzah, and greetings, and all hail friends well met. Welcome to Southwest Shakespeare, a founding resident company of Mesa Arts Center in beautiful Mesa, Arizona. I am Bo Heckman, associate artist here at Southwest Shakespeare Company and daily host of Storytime Classics Live. It is my pleasure to be your host for tonight's show and a bunch of uh, other good stuff. In just a few moments, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, directed by Ian Christensen, will begin. But before I hand it over to Ian, I'd like to let you know that tickets for our 21-22 season are now officially on sale. You can visit the box office anytime at swshakes.org. I'll be back during intermission to tell you all about the fabulous lineup of eight plays and many other thrilling events we have coming soon to a theater near you. And if you're not ready or able to return to the theater, all shows and programs will be streamed to you at home, wherever you have a device. Your tickets will be good in person or far from the maddening crowd. Go to swshakes.org to book. And while you are there, the real purpose for tonight's show is to celebrate Arizona Gives Day. We have done a lot of fundraising already. We are almost there. This show, this show, this show is free. But we still have $350,000 to raise to pay the slew of actors, directors, designers, fabricators, builders, stitchers, the lighting, sound, and now video broadcast technicians, stage managers, wardrobe assistants, musicians, and of course, the folks working the front of house and the administrative, education and community engagement team that it takes to make a season. <laughs> this year, because of tremendous loss and limited seating in the months to come, we have kept our prices low. Students and educators can still see our shows for $10. Every seat in the house costs us close to $70 to produce. Not only are student tickets subsidized, but every ticket is subsidized. The mission of our 501c3 charity is to uplift, educate, and entertain. And we want everyone to be able to take part. Please, if you have a little extra during these trying times and can help by donating so that those who are in need might still have access, we will be forever in your debt. Six generous donors have combined to offer a matching grant. Today, they will match dollar for dollar any donation you make up to $60,000. Thank you, Chuck and Lori Goldstein, Debbie and Mike Elliott, Rebecca and Bill Smead, and Raj Savanathan. Please take a minute to go to swshakes.org and help us take advantage of this amazing challenge opportunity. This month marks Shakespeare's 475th birthday. What better gift for the Bard than to keep his incredible legacy available in our community? 457 and still alive. Please contribute, if you can, swshakes.org. And now for the redoubtable Mr. Ian Christensen. Ian is a core member of the company here at Southwest Shakes. He is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon School of Drama and has been on the road as one of Phoenix's most acting actors. Most notably, he's produced cabarets of his own. And tonight, he directs Two Gents. I'll be back at the half to razzle-dazzle you with our 28th season big reveal. Now, over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Bo. And good evening, everybody. I'm Ian Christensen, director of Two Gentlemen of Verona, and as Bo has mentioned, a member of the core company of Southwest Shakespeare Company, uh, where I have been on stage before, both in Two Gentlemen of Verona and Love's Labor's Lost and other productions. I want to thank you for joining us tonight to tune in for this special broadcast. And I also want to thank you for being part of Arizona Gives Day. It's a very important day that helps the arts and foundations and organizations across the state. Now, Two Gentlemen of Verona is a very interesting play to me. Um, it deals with love on all sorts of levels. Uh, I like to think of it as <laughs> how Romeo and Juliet could have gone 
which is ironic because it takes place in the same city as Romeo and Juliet, the lovely Italian city of Verona. Um, this cast is wonderful. They were really terrific to work with and um, a really terrific group of actors with so much tenacity and, and so much uh, life and vivaciousness that it was an absolute joy to work with them and get to mold and shape the story together. Now, the play deals with love on all sorts of levels. It deals with falling in love for the first time. It deals with falling out of love for the first time. It deals with falling in love with somebody you weren't sure you were going to be in love with. And it deals with um, the servant class, the noble nobility class, drama, intrigue, uh, cheating, uh, Mm, all that good stuff that the Bard usually includes in any of his in, in any of his good plays, and the reason that I call it uh, the way Romeo and Juliet Romeo and Juliet could have gone is obvious because Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy where there's this is a comedy. It is, however, very challenging to observe that some pretty heavy things happen in this show. Uh, one of our male protagonists, uh, Proteus. Um, has a very mercurial love life and falls in and out of love like crazy, which is why I needed a good cast for this because it's um, <laughs> the characters fall hard and fast. And if we don't get invested in them uh, as the people that they are, and they're all pretty good people, it's hard to see the story through to the end without, uh, without questioning the characters' motives. Um, we have the wonderful servants, Launce and Speed, which add a lot of comedy to this. This is also the Shakespeare play that prominently features a dog. Uh, uh, Launce's dog, <laughs> excuse me, Launce's dog, Crab, gets him in quite a bit of trouble. Our four main lovers, uh, Sylvia, Julia, Proteus, and Valentine, find themselves all in various stages of attraction, of betrayal, and of rediscovering what love and friendship is really all about. I do want to thank the cast for all their marvelous work on this on this virtual show, and um, I hope that you enjoy The Two Gentlemen of Verona. Thank you. Cease to persuade my loving Proteus, homekeeping youth have ever homely wits. I rather would entreat thy company to see the wonders of the world abroad than living dully sluggardized at home. Wear out thy youth with shapeless idleness. But since thou lovest, love still and thrive therein, even as I would when I too love begin. Wilt thou be gone? <laughs> oh, <laughs> sweet Valentine, adieu. Think on thy Proteus when thou happily seest some rare noteworthy object in thy travel, for I will be thy bedsman 
Valentine. And on a love book, pray for my success. Upon some book I love, I'll pray for thee. Tis true, for you are over boots in love, and yet you have never swum the Hellespont. Over the boots? Nay, give me not the boots. No, I will not, for it boots thee not. What? So by your circumstance you call me fool. So by your circumstance I fear you'll prove. Oh, tis love you cavil at. I am not love. Love is your master, for he masters you. And he that is so yoked by a fool, methinks should not be chronicled for wise. But wherefore waste I time to counsel thee? My father at the road expects my coming. There to see me shipped. Once more, adieu. All happiness be chance to thee in Milan. As much to you at home, and so farewell. He after honor hunts, I after love. He leaves his friends to dignify them more. I leave myself, my friends, and all for love. <laughs> thou, Julia, thou hast metamorphosed me. Sir Proteus, <laughs> save you. Uh, saw you, my master, Sir Valentine. Ah, uh, but now he parted hence to embark for Milan. That's funny to one that he shipped already, and I have played the sheep and losing him. Indeed, a sheep doth very often stray, and if the shepherd be a while away. Oh, the shepherd seeks the sheep, and not the sheep the shepherd, but I seek my master, and my master seeks not me, therefore I am no sheep. The sheep for fodder follow the shepherd, the shepherd for food follows not the sheep. Thou for wages followest thy master, thy master for wages follows not thee. Therefore, thou art a sheep. Oh, such another proof will make me cry bah. But dost thou hear, gavest thou my letter to Julia? Aye, sir, <clears throat> I a lost mutton gave your letter to her, a laced mutton, and she a laced mutton gave me a lost mutton, nothing. <laughs> Through me, but you have a quick wit. And yet it cannot overtake your slow purse. Oh, come, come, open the matter in brief. What said she? Open your purse, that the money in the matter may be at once delivered. Well, sir, here is for your pains. What said she? Sir, I could perceive nothing at all from her for delivering your letter and being so hard to me. I fear she'll prove as hard to you, for she's as hard as steel. What said she? Nothing. No, not so much as pick this for my pains. You have testered me and requital winner out henceforth. Carry your letters yourself. No, oh, go, go, be gone to save your ship from wreck. And so, sir, I'll commend you to my master. I must go send some better messenger. I fear my Julia would not deign my lines, receiving them from such a worthless post. Say, Lucetta, now that we are alone, of all the fair resort of gentlemen that every day with Paulet encounter me, in thy opinion, which is worthiest love? What thinkest thou of the fair Sir Eglamour? As of a knight well spoken, neat and fine, but where are you? He never should be mine. What thinkest thou of the rich Mercaccio? Well, of his wealth. But of himself, so-so. Uh, what thinkest thou of the gentle Podius? <laughs> Pardon, dear madam, tis a passing shame that I, unworthy body as I am, should censure thus on lovely gentlemen. Why not on Podius as of all the rest? Of many good, I think him best. Why he of all the rest hath never moved me? Yet he, of all the rest, I think best loves ye. Peruse this letter, madam. To Julia? Say from whom? <laughs> Valentine's page, and sent, I think, from Proteus. He would have given it to you, but I, being in the way, did in your name receive it. <laughs> Pardon the fault, I pray. Dare you presume to harbor wanton lines? To whisper and conspire against my youth? Now see to return, or else return no more into my sight. 
To plead for love deserves more fee than hate. Will ye be gone? <sighs> that you may ruminate. Fie, fie, how wayward is this foolish love that like a testy babe will scratch the nurse and presently all humble kiss the rod. How churlishly I chid Lucetta hint when willingly I would have had her here. My penance is to call Lucetta back and ask permission for my folly past. What ho, Lucetta? What would your ladyship? Isn't it near dinner time? <laughs> I would it were that you might kill your stomach on your meat and not upon your maid. And what is it that you took up so gingerly? Nothing concerning me. Then let it lie for those that it concerns. Madam. It will not lie where it concerns unless it have a false interpreter. You, minion, are too saucy. <laughs> Nay, now you are too flat and mar the concord with too harsh a descant. Indeed, I bid the base for Proteus. This babble shall not henceforth troubles me. Here in court with protestation. Get you gone and let the papers lie. You will be fingering them to anger me. Nay, when I were so angered with the same. Oh, hateful hands that tear such loving words. I'll kiss each several paper for amends. Look, here is writ, kind Julia, unkind Julia. Oh, and here is writ, love wounded Podius, poor wounded name. My bosom as a bed shall lodge thee till thy wound be thoroughly healed. And thus I'll search it with a sovereign kiss. Be calm, good wind. Blow not a word away till I have found each letter in the letter, except my own name, that some whirlwind bear unto a ragged, fearful hanging rock and throw it thence into the raging sea. Ooh, lo, and here in one line is his name twice writ. Poor Bolon. Proteus, passionate Proteus, to thy sweet Julia, that I'll tear away. And yet I will not, since so prettily he couples it to his complaining names. Thus I will fold it one unto another. Now kiss, embrace, contend, do what you will. Madam, dinner is ready and your father stays. Well, let us go. What shall these papers lie like telltales here? If you respect them, best to take them up. Nay, I was taken up for laying them down, yet here they shall not lie for catching cold. Come, come, will please you go? Tell me, Pantino. What sad talk was that wherewithin my brother held you in the cloister? He wondered that your lordship would suffer Proteus to spend his youth at home, while other men of slender reputation put forth their sons to seek preferment out, some to the wars to try their fortune there, some to discover islands far away, some to the studious universities. For any or for all these exercises, he said that Proteus, your son, was meet and did request me to importune you to let him spend his youth no more at home. No needest thou much importune me to that whereon this month I have been hammering. I have considered well his loss of time. Tell me, whither were I best to send him? I think your lordship is not ignorant how his companion, youthful Valentine, attends the emperor in his royal court. T'were good, I think, your lordship sent him thither. There shall he be an eye of every exercise, worthy his youth and nobleness of birth. I like thy counsel. Well hast thou advised. I will dispatch him to the emperor's court. Tomorrow, may it please you. Don Alfonso, with other gentlemen of good esteem, are journeying to salute the emperor. Good company. With them shall Proteus go. And in good time, now will we break him. 
Sweet love, sweet line, sweet life. Here is her hand, here is her oath for love. How now? What letter, letter are you reading there? Uh, may it please your lordship, tis a word or two of commendation sent from Valentine. Lend me the letter. Let me see what news. Uh, there is no news, my lord, but wishing me with him partner of his fortune. My will is something sorted with his wish. I am resolved that thou shalt spend some time with Valentinus in the emperor's court. Tomorrow, be in readiness to go. My lord, I, I cannot be so soon provided. Please you deliberate a day or two. Look, what thou wantest shall be sent after thee. Come on, Pantheo. You shall be employed to hasten on his expedition. Thus have I shunned the fire for fear of burning and drenched me in the sea where I am drowned. I feared to show my father Julia's letter, lest he should take exceptions to my love. And with the vantage of mine own excuse, hath he accepted most against my love. Sir Proteus, your father calls for you. He is in haste, therefore I pray you to go. Why, this it is. My heart accords thereto, and yet a thousand times it answers no. Sir, your glove. Not mine, my gloves are on. Oh, why then this may be yours, for this is but one. <laughs> Let me see. I give it to me, it's mine. Sweet ornament that decks a thing divine. Ah, oh, Sylvia, Sylvia. Oh, Madam Sylvia, Madam Sylvia. <laughs> see that your worship loves? Why, how know you that I am in love? Merry by these special marks. <laughs> you were wont when you laughed to crow like a cock, when you walked to walk like one of the lions, when you fasted, it was presently after dinner, eh, when you looked sadly, it was for want of money, and now you're metamorphosed with a mistress that when I look on you, I can hardly think you my master. Are all these things perceived in me? They are all perceived that you are so like the water in a urine hole that not an eye that sees you is a physician to comment on your malady. But tell me, dost thou know my lady, Sylvia? She that you gaze on so as she sits at supper? I account of her beauty. You never saw her since she was deformed. How long hath she been deformed? Never since you loved her. Why? Because love is blind. Oh, that you had mine eyes or your own eyes at the lights they would want to have when you chit at Sir Proteus for going unguarded. What should I see then? He, being in love, could not see to garter his hose, and you, being in love, cannot see to <coughs> put on your hose. Be like, boy, then you are in love. For last morning, you could not see to wipe my shoes. True. Sir, I was in love with my bed. I would you were set so your affections would cease. Last night she enjoined me to write some lines to one she loves. <laughs> and have you? I have. Are they not lamely writ? Uh, no, boy, but as well as I can do them. Uh, peace, it, here she comes. Well, now will he interpret to her? Madam and mistress, a thousand good morrows. Oh, give ye good even. Here's a million of manners. Her valentine and servant to you two thousand. You should give her interest and she gives it him. As you enjoined me, I have writ your letter unto the secret nameless friend of yours. I thank you, gentle servant. Tis very clerkly done. Now, trust me, madam, it came hardly off. For being ignorant to whom it goes, I writ at random, very doubtfully. And yet, so it stead you, I will write, please you command, a thousand times as much. A pretty period. Well, I guess the sequel, and yet I thank you. And yet take this again. I would have them writ more movingly. Please you, I'll write your ladyship another. And when it's writ, for my sake, Read it over, and if it please you so, if not, why so? If it please me, madam, what then? 
Why, if it please you, take it for your labor. And so good morrow, servant. <laughs> oh, excellent device. Was there ever heard a better than my master being scribed to himself should write the letter? <laughs> How now, sir? What are you reasoning with yourself? <laughs> hey, I was rhyming. Tis you that have the reason. To do what? But to be a spokesman for Madame Sylvia. To whom? To yourself. She had made you write to yourself. Do you not perceive the jest? <laughs> no, believe me. And no believing you indeed, sir. Why oh, amuse you? Tis dinner time. I have dined. Aye, but hearken, sir, though the chameleon love can feed on the air, I am one that am nourished by my meat. Oh, be not like your mistress. Be moved. Be moved. <laughs> Have patience, gentle Julia. If you turn not, you return the sooner. Keep this remembrance for thy Julia's sake. Why then, we'll make exchange. Here, take you this. And seal the bargain with a holy kiss. Here is my hand for my true constancy. And when that hour o'erslips me in the day, wherein I sigh not, Julia, for thy sake, the next ensuing hour some foul mischance torment me for my love's forgetfulness. Oh, my father stays my coming. Answer not. Julia, farewell. What, gone without a word? Aye. So true love should do. I cannot speak, for truth hath better deeds than words to grace it. Sir Proteus, you are stayed for. Go, I, I come, I come. Alas, this parting strikes poor lovers dumb. <laughs> Our air, I have done weeping. <laughs> All the kin of the lances have this very fault. <laughs> I am going with Sir Proteus to the Imperial Court. <laughs> I think Crab, my dog, be the sourest nature dog that lives. My mother weeping, my father wailing, my sister crying, our maid howling, our cat wringing her hand, and all our house in great perplexity. Yet did this cruel-hearted cur shed one tear? He is a stone, a very pebble stone, and has no more Pity in him than a dog. Why, my grandam, having no eyes, look you, wept herself blind at my party. And now the dog all the while sheds not a tear, nor speaks a word. Lost, away, away, aboard. Thy master is shipped. Why weepest thou, man? Away, ass. Why dost thou stop my mouth? For fear thou shalt lose thy tongue. Where should I lose my tongue? In thy tail. In thy tail? You'll lose the tide if you tarry any longer. Lose the tide, and the voyage, and the master, and the service. Why, man, if the river were dry, I am able to fill it with my tears. If the wind were down, I could drive the boat with my sighs. Come, come away, man. I was sent to call thee. Sir, call me what thou darest. Wilt thou go? Well, 
I will go. Urbent. Mistress? Master, <laughs> Sir Thorio frowns on you. For good you knocked him. Servant, you're sad. Indeed, madam, I seem so. So do counterfeits. So do you. What seem I that I am not? Wise. How? What, angry, Sir Thorio? Do you change color? Give him leave, madam. He is a kind of chameleon. That hath more mind to feed on your blood than live in your air. You have said, sir. Go find volley of words, gentlemen, and quickly shot off. Tis indeed, madam, we thank the giver. Who is that, servant? Yourself, sweet lady, for you gave the fire. Sir Thurio borrows his wit from your ladyship's looks and spends what he borrows kindly in your company. Sir, if you spend word for word with me, I shall make your wit bankrupt. No more, gentlemen, no more. Here comes my father. Now, daughter Sylvia, you are hard beset. Sir Valentine, know you Don Antonio, your countryman? Aye, my good lord, I know the gentleman to be of worth. Hath he not a son? Aye, my good lord. You know him well? I know him as myself, for from our infancy we have conversed and spent our hours together. And hath Sir Proteus, for that's his name, made use and fair advantage of his days. His years but young, but his experience old. He is complete in feature and in mind, with all good grace to grace a gentleman. Well, sir, this gentleman has come to me, and here he means to spend his time a while. I think tis no unwelcome news to you. Should I have wished a thing, had it been he? Welcome him, then, according to his worth. Uh, Sylvia, I speak to you and you, Sir Thurio. For Valentine, I need not cite him to it. I will send him hither to you presently. This is the gentleman I told your ladyship had come along with me, but that his mistress did hold his eyes locked in her crystal looks. You like that now she hath enfranchised them upon some other pawn for fealty? Nay, sure, I think she holds them prisoners still. Nay, then he should be blind, and being blind, how could he see his way to seek out you? Why, lady, love hath twenty pair of eyes. They say that love hath not an eye at all. To see such lovers, Thurio, as yourself, upon a homely object, love can wink. Have done, have done. Here comes the gentleman. <sighs> Welcome, dear Proteus. Mistress, I beseech you, confirm his welcome with some special favor. His worth is warrant for his welcome hither, if this be he you oft have wished to hear from. Mistress, it is sweet lady, entertain him to be my fellow servant to your ladyship. You low a mistress for so high a servant. Not so, sweet lady, but too mean a servant to have a look of such a worthy mistress. Madam, my lord, your father would speak with you. I wait upon his pleasure. Come, Sir Thurio, go with me. Oh, once more, new servant, welcome. I'll leave you to confer of home affairs. When you have done, we look to hear from you. We'll both attend upon your ladyship. Now, tell me, how do all from whence you came? How does your lady... And how thrived your love? Oh, my tales of love were wont to weary you. I know you joy not in a love discourse. Ay, Proteus, but that life is altered now. Oh, gentle Proteus loves a mighty lord and hath so humbled me. Now I can break my fast, dine, sup, and sleep upon the very naked name of love. Enough. I read your fortune in your eye. Was she the idol that you worship so? Even she, and is she not a heavenly saint? No, but she is an earthly paragon. Call her divine. I will not flatter her. <laughs> oh, flatter me, for love delights in praises. Why, Valentine, what braggartism is this? Pardon me, Proteus, all I can is nothing to her whose worth makes other worthies nothing. She is alone. Then let her alone. 
Not for the world. Why, man, she is mine own, and I is rich in having such a jewel as twenty seas, if all their sand were pearl, the water, nectar, and the rocks pure gold. <sighs> My foolish rival that her father likes only for his possessions are so huge is gone with her along, and I must after, for love, thou knowest, is full of jealousy. Hmm. But she loves you. Hi. And we are betrothed, nay, more, our marriage hour, with all the cunning manner of our flight determined of how I must climb her window, the ladder made of cords. <laughs> Good Bronius, go with me to my chamber, in these affair to aid me with thy counsel. Go on before. I, I must unto the road to disembark some necessaries, and then I'll presently attend you. Will you make haste? I will. <sighs> Even as one heat, another heat expels, or as one nail by strength drives out another, so the remembrance of my former love is by a newer object quite forgotten. Julia, that I love, that I did love, for now my love is thawed. Methinks my zeal to Valentine is cold, and that I love him not as I was wont. Oh, but I love his lady too, too much, and that's the reason I love him so little. If I can check my erring love, I will. If not, to compass her. I'll use my skill. Lons, by mine honesty, welcome to Milan. Forswear not thyself, sweet youth, for I am not welcome. Come on, you madcap. I'll to the alehouse with you presently, where for one shot of five pence, thou shalt have five thousand welcomes. Uh, but, Sira, how did thy master part with Madame Julia? Shall she marry him? No. How then, Joe, he marry her? Ask my dog. If he say yea, it will. If he say no, it will. If he shake his tail and say nothing, it will. <laughs> the conclusion is then that it will. <laughs> Thou shalt never get such a secret from me, but by a parable. Tis well that I get it so. Uh, but Lance. How sayest thou that my master has become a notable lover? Why, I care not, though he burns himself with love. <laughs> Wilt thou take me to the alehouse? At thy service. <laughs> Leave my Julia shall I be forsworn. To love Sylvia shall I be forsworn. To wrong my friend I shall be much forsworn. And even that power which gave me first my oath provokes me to this threefold perjury. Love bade me swear, and love bids me forswear. I cannot leave to love, and yet I do. But there I leave to love where I should love. Julia I lose, and Valentine I lose. If I keep them, I needs must lose myself. If I lose them, thus find I by their loss. For Valentine, myself, for Julia, Sylvia. I to myself am dearer than a friend, for love is still most precious in itself. I cannot now prove constant to myself without some treachery used to Valentine. This night, he meaneth to, with a corded ladder, to climb Celestial Sylvia's chamber window, myself his competitor. Presently I'll give her father notice of their disguising and pretended flight, who, all enraged, will banish Valentine. For Thurio, he intends, shall wed his daughter, but Valentine, being gone, I'll quickly cross by some sly trick Blunt Thurio's dull proceeding. 
love lend me wings to make my purpose swift, as thou hast lent me wit to plot this drift. Counsel, Lucetta, gentle girl, assist me. Tell me some good mean how, with my honor, I may undertake a journey to my loving Podius. Oh, alas, the way is wearisome and long. Better forbear till Proteus make return. Didst thou but know the inly touch of love? Thou wouldst as soon go kindle fire with snow as seek to quench the fire of love with words. I do not seek to quench your love's hot fire, but qualify the fire's extreme rage, lest it burn above the bounds of reason. I'll be as gentle, I'll be as patient as a gentle stream, and make a pastime of each weary step, till the last step have brought me to my love, and there I rest, as after much turmoil a blessed soul doth in Elysium. But in what habit will you go along? Not like a woman, for I would prevent to the loose encounters a lascivious men. Gentle Lucetta, fit me with such weeds as may beseech some well-reputed page. What fashion, madam, shall I make your breeches? Why, even what fashion thou best likest, Lucetta? But tell me, how will the world repute me for undertaking so unstayed a journey? I fear me will make me scandalized. If you think so, then stay at home and go not. Nay, I will not. Then never dream of infamy, but go. If Proteus like your journey, no matter who's displeased. But I fear me, he will scarce be pleased with you. A thousand oaths, an ocean of his tears, and instances of, and instances of infinite of love, warrant me welcome to my Proteus. All these are servants to deceitful men base men that use them so, to so base effect. But true as stars did govern Podius' birth, his words are bonds, his oaths are oracles, his love sincere, his thoughts immaculate, his heart as far from fraud as heaven from earth. Pray heaven he proves so. Now, as thou lovest me, do him not that wrong to bear a hard opinion of his truth. Only presently go with me to my chamber to furnish me upon my longing journey. All that is mine, I leave at thy disposal. My goods, my lands, my reputation, only in lieu thereof to patch me hence. Come, answer not, but do it presently. I'm impatient of my tarians. Sir Thurio, give us leave, I pray, a while. We have some secrets to confer about. Now, tell me, Proteus, what's your will with me? My gracious lord, that which I would discover, the law of friendship, bids me to conceal. But when I call to mind your gracious favors done to me, undeserving as I am, my duty pricks me on to utter that which else no worldly good should draw from me. No, worthy prince, Sir Valentine, my friend, this knight intends to steal away your daughter. Proteus, I thank thee for thine honest care. This love of theirs myself have often seen, haply when they have judged me fast asleep. Knowing that tender youth is soon suggested, I nightly lodge her in an upper tower, the key whereof myself have ever kept, and thence she cannot be conveyed away. Uh, no, noble lord. They have devised a mean how he, her chamber window, will ascend and with a corded ladder fetch her down, for which the youthful lover now is gone, and this way comes he with it presently, where, if it please you, you may intercept him. Uh, but, good my lord, do it so cunningly that my discovery be not aimed at. For love of you, not hate unto my friend, hath made me publisher of this pretense. Upon mine honor, he shall never know that I had any light from thee of this. Uh, adieu, my lord. Uh, Sir Valentine is coming. Mm -hmm. Sir Valentine! <laughs> Whither away so fast? 
Please it, your grace, there is a messenger that stays to bear my letters to my friends, and I'm going to deliver them. Be they of much import? The tenor of them doth but signify my health and happy being at your court. Nay, then, no matter. Stay with me a while. I am to break with thee of some affairs that touch me near, wherein thou must be secret. Tis not unknown to thee that I have sought to match my friend Sir Thurio to my daughter. Cannot your grace win her love to fancy him? No, trust me, she is peevish, sullen, froward, proud, disobedient, stubborn, lacking duty, neither regarding that she is my child nor fearing me as I were her father. And may I say to thee, this pride of hers upon advice hath drawn my love from her, and where I thought the remnant of mine age should have been cherished by her childlike duty, I now am full resolved to take a wife and turn her out to who will take her in. Then let her beauty be her wedding dower. For me and my possessions she esteems not. What would your grace have me to do in this? <laughs> there is a lady in Verona here whom I affect, but she not see esteems my aged eloquence. Now, therefore, would I have thee to my tutor for long agone, I have forgot to court. Besides, the fashion of the time has changed. How and which way may I bestow myself to be regarded in her sun-bright eye? Win her with gifts, if she respect not words. Dumb jewels often in their silent kind, more than quick words, do move a woman's mind. If she do frown, tis not in hate of you, but rather to beget more love in you. Whatever she doth say, for get you gone, she doth not mean away. Flatter and praise, commend, extol their graces. That man that hath a tongue, I say, is no man, if with his tongue he cannot win a woman. But she is promised unto a youthful gentleman of worth and kept severally from resort of men, that no man hath access by day to her. Why, then I would resort to her by night. <laughs> but the doors be locked, and keys kept safe, that no man hath recourse to her by night. What lets but one may enter at her window? <laughs> her chamber is aloft, far from the ground, and built so shelving that one cannot climb it without apparent hazard of his life. Why, then a ladder quaintly made of cords to cast up with a pair of anchoring hooks would serve to scale another hero's tower so bold Leander would adventure it. How shall I best convey the ladder thither? It will be light, my lord, uh, that thou may bear it under a cloak that is of any length. Let me see thy cloak. Uh, I'll get me one of such another length. Why, any cloak will serve the turn, my lord. I pray thee, let me feel thy cloak upon me. What letter is this same? What's here? <sighs> to Sylvia. I'll be so bold to break the seal for once. My thoughts do harbor with my Sylvia nightly. Sylvia, this night I will enfranchise thee. Tis so, and here's the ladder for the purpose. Why, thou art Merop's son. Go, base intruder, bestow thy fawning smiles on equal mates, and think my patience <laughs> in privilege for thy departure hence. Thank me for this more than for all the favors which all too much I have bestowed on thee. If thou linger in my territories longer than swiftest expedition will give thee time to leave our royal court by heaven. <laughs> my wrath shall far exceed the love I ever bore my daughter or thyself. Be gone. I will not hear thy vain excuse, but as thou lovest thy life, make speed from hence. <sighs> And why not death rather than living torment? To die is to be banished from myself, and Sylvia is myself. Banished from her is self from self, a deadly banishment. 
Tarry I here, I but attend on death. But fly I hence, I fly away from life. Run, boy, run, run and seek him out. So ho, so ho. What seest thou? Him we go to find. Valentine. No. Who then? His spirit? Neither. What then? <sighs> nothing. Why, sir, I'll strike nothing. I pray you. Uh, syrup, forbear. Friend Valentine, a word. My ears are stopped and cannot hear good news. So much of bad already hath possessed them. Then in dumb silence will I bury mine, for they are harsh, untunable, and bad. Is Sylvia dead? No, Valentine. No, Valentine, indeed. If Sylvia hath forsworn me, what is your news? Sir, there is a proclamation that you have vanished. Thou art banished! Oh, that's the news. From hence, from Sylvia, and from me, thy friend. Does Sylvia know that I am banished? Aye, aye. She tendered upon her knees, her humble self, but neither bended knees. Pure hands held up, sad sighs, deep groans, nor silver shedding tears could penetrate her uncompassionate sire. Besides, her intercession chafed him so that to close prison he commanded her. No more, unless the next word that thou speak'st have some malignant power upon my life. Cease to lament for that thou canst not help. Time is the nurse and breeder of all good. If thou stay, thou canst not see thy love. Besides, thy staying will abridge thy life. Come, I'll convey thee through the city gate. As thou lovest Sylvia, Though not for thyself, regard thy danger, and along with me. I pray thee, Launce, and if thou seest speed, bid him make haste and meet me at the north gate. Go, Sirrah, find him out. Come, Valentine. Look you, I have the wit to think my master is a kind of knave. But that's all one, if he be but one knave. He lives not now that knows me to be in love. Yet I am in love. Oh, but a team of horses could not pluck that from me, nor who tis I love. It is a woman. <clears throat> but what woman? <laughs> It is a milkmaid, <laughs> yet uh, it is not a maid, for she hath had gossips. Yet it is a maid, for she is her master's maid and serves her wages. <laughs> Here is the catalogue of her condition. How now, Signor Lons? What news with your mastership? With my master's ship, why, it is at sea. Eh? Well, 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 you old vice still mistake the word. Uh, what news then in your paper? Oh, the blackest news that e'er thou heardest. Why, man, how black? Why, as black as ink. Let me read them. <laughs> oh, fie on thee, jolt head, thou canst not read. Thou liest, I can. Oh, I will try thee. Tell me, who begot thee? Mary, the son of my grandfather. <laughs> oh, illiterate loiterer. It was the son of thy grandmother. This proves thou canst not read. Come, fool, come, try me in your paper. Mm, there. And Sir Nicholas be thy speed. Imprimis, she can sew. That's as much to say. Can she so? Items she can wash and scour. Ooh, a special virtue, for then she need not be washed and scoured. Items she can spin. Ah, oh, then may I set the world on wheels when she can spin for her living. 
Ah, here follow her vices. Ugh, close at the heels of her virtues. <laughs> I item she is not to be kissed fasting in respect of her breath. Well, that's fault may be mended with a breakfast. Uh, read on. Item she had the sweet mouth. Oh, well, that makes amends for her sour breath. Item she doth talk in her sleep. It's no matter for that, so she sleeps not in her talk. Item, she is slow in words. <laughs> Villain that set this down among her vices. To be slow in words is a woman's only virtue. I pray thee, outfit, and place it as her chief virtue. Ah. Item, she is proud. Oh, out with that too. It was Eve's legacy and cannot be taken from her. I don't she have no teeth. Oh, I, <clears throat> I care not for that neither, because I love crusts. I don't she is too liberal. Of her tongue she cannot, for that's writ down she is slow of. Uh, of her purse she shall not, for that I'll keep shut. <sighs> now, well, proceed. I don't she has more hair than wit and more wealth than fault. Oh, stop there. <gasps> oh, I'll have her. <laughs> she was mine and not mine. And twice or thrice in that last article. <laughs> Rehearse that once more. I don't she has more hair than wit and more wealth than fault. Oh, why? That word makes the faults gracious. Oh, <laughs> Well, I will have her. Uh, and if it not be a match, then uh, as nothing is impossible. What then? Why then will I tell thee that thy master stays for thee at the north gate? For me? For thee? Oh, who art thou? He hath stayed for a better man than thee. And must I go to him? Oh, thou must run to him, for thou hast stayed so long that going will scarce serve the term. Why didst not tell me sooner, box of your love letters? <laughs> now he will be swinged for reading my letter, an unmannerly slave that will thrust himself into secrets. Sir Thurio, fear not, but that she will love you. Now Valentine is banished from her sight. Since his exile, she hath despised me most, forsworn my company, and railed at me. A little time will melt her frozen thoughts, and worthless Valentine shall be forgot. How now, Sir Proteus, is your countryman, according to our proclamation, gone? Gone, my good lord. My daughter takes his going grievously. A little time, my lord, will kill that grief. So I believe, but Thurio thinks not so. What might we do to make the girl forget the love of Valentine and love Sir Thurio? Uh, the best way is to slander Valentine. Aye, but she'll think that is spoken hate. Aye, aye, if his enemy deliver it. Therefore, it must with circumstance be spoken by one whom she esteemeth as his friend. Then you must undertake to slander him. But say this weed her love from Valentine, it follows not that she will love Sir Thurio. Therefore, as you unwind her love from him, praise me as much as you worth this praise Sir Valentine. As much as I can do, I will effect. But you... Sir Thurio, are not sharp enough. You must lay lime to tangle her desires by wailful sonnets. After your dire lamenting elegies, visit by night your lady's chamber window with some sweet concert. The night's dead silence will well welcome such sweet complaining grievance. This, or else nothing, will inherit her. This discipline shows thou hast been in love. And thy advice this night I'll put in practice. Therefore, sweet Proteus, let us into the city presently to sort some gentlemen well skilled in music. I have a sonnet that will serve the turn to give the onset to thy good advice. 
about it, gentlemen. As promised, I'm back. We hope you're enjoying our time together. And we look forward to many more good times ahead as we reveal Southwest Shakespeare's 2021-22 live theater season. That's right. With all fingers and toes crossed, we will be back in the theater in October 2021. Can I have a drum roll, please? We don't have a drum. Can you order one? Let me know. Well, here it is. April. Our 28th season begins this Saturday with the Flockman Seminar. Dr. Susan Willis, advisor on the BBC Canon Project, will be sharing her knowledge, wit, and wisdom in a discussion about, surprise, the two gentlemen of Verona. So if you'd like a deeper dive and meet the actors and folks who made tonight's show, sign up now for the Flockman Seminar. In October, at Taliesin West, we open with Legends of the Werewolf, written by Bo Heckman. At, wait, what? And directed by Mary Way, just in time for Halloween. Receive a full education pertaining to the natural phenomenon of werewolves. Where did they come from and where did they go? Are they behind you right now? <laughs> the last two weeks of October, Southwest Shakes takes a brief hiatus to travel to England and France on a trek following the progression of the crown throughout Shakespeare's histories. We return in November, Veterans Weekend. We have the world premiere of a new play by David Barker, From Tidworth with Love, based on his parents' letters during his father's deployment in World War II. It's a charming and powerful love story, full of the highs of romance and the trials of active military service. We welcome all, especially veterans, to this performance and will have talkbacks immediately afterward to discuss the psychological ramifications of war and to thank those in active service. November, at Taliesin West, we have an opportunity to see our touring show, A 90-Minute Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, written by William Shakespeare, directed by David Ira Goldstein. The cast of this show have been studying Hamlet for the past 12 weeks. This will be our most powerfully rehearsed show ever. We will welcome the opportunity to share the touring show with our audience at home. And this year, we return to Sedona. You will have another opportunity to see our touring Hamlet in Sedona in February in the Sedona Performing Arts Center. Teachers and community groups can also book this show, and the Prince of Denmark will come to you. In December, we have a surprise. For the first time ever, a traditional British panto, Scrooge. It will seem modern, but pantos have been a favorite winter treat in the UK since the 1400s. Panto takes a familiar story and turns it on its side in a hilarious spoof. It's a romp. Men play women and women play men, and the audience has its part to play too. Heckling is encouraged. And while there is an adult line of humor, these shows are intended for audiences of all ages. A holiday delight. Come and try Scrooge the Panto at Old Town Scottsdale's Stagebrush Theater. And finally, our main stage events at Mesa Arts Center, the Spring Rep. February, we open with The Tempest by William Shakespeare, directed by Ingrid Sonicson, and Ferinelli and the King by Claire Van Campen, directed by Carmen Jacobi. The Tempest is Shakespeare's fantastical imagining inspired by the real-life shipwreck of the Sea Venture, one of the British fleet lost off the coast of the Bermudas in 1609. The fleet was on its way to the new Jamestown settlement in Virginia. Spirits, mythic creatures, and magic abound. Right now we are watching Shakespeare's alleged first play. By comparison, The Tempest is thought to be the last play Shakespeare wrote on his own in 1610. Please don't miss it. 
Farinelli and the King is a contemporary play orchestrated with Baroque music based on the true story of King Philip V of Spain and his friendship with the most famous countertenor, Castrato, of the 18th century, Farinelli. This play opened at Shakespeare's Globe in 2016 and won several Olivier Awards. It is a charming, soulful story about opera, leadership, friendship, and mental illness. It's expected to be released as a major motion picture, but see its Arizona premiere here first. And finally, in late spring, we will be back at Taliesin West for an Arizona premiere of Mojada, a Medea in Los Angeles. And shall I compare thee, the sonnets. In April, shall I compare thee, brings the sonnets to life as rarely performed prose take the stage with lyrics, music, dance, and images. Come sing hymns at heaven's gates like break of day arising at this extraordinary celebration of life, love, and the pursuit of happiness in a post-COVID world. Adapted and arranged by SSC artistic director, Mary Way. In May, A Medea in LA is written by MacArthur Genius Awardee, Luis Alfaro. It's the story of a Mexican family in parallel with the classic Greek tragedy, Medea. The play has been staged at Oregon Shakespeare Festival and the Getty in LA, and is only possible here by special permission of the playwright. It will be directed by Vice Provost of ASU, Head of Inclusion, and Oregon Shakespeare Festival dramaturg, Dr. Tiffany Anna Lopez and Melanie Capons. Starting today, these plays are available by single ticket purchase. And between now and April 13th, you can also invest in a completely flexible season pass called the Bard Card, which offers you eight premium reserved tickets, one to each play or pick and choose and use your extra tickets to see a play twice or bring a friend. The Bard Card includes opening parties, first read receptions, and two of our famous Flockman seminars. If purchased separately, the value of this programming is $645. If you purchase before April 13th, the price is $295. That's a savings of $350. That's over a 53% discount. All tickets are now on sale at swshakes.org. And if you have something extra to help us keep these tickets affordable to those who are struggling, and help subsidize the $10 student tickets. We are a 501c3 charity, and would we would be so very grateful for your donation. Remember, if you are paying less than $68 per ticket, you are being subsidized by the generosity of others. Go to swshakes.org. Please accept our heartfelt thanks. Come back early and often, and enjoy the riveting conclusion of the Two Gentlemen of Verona. Stand fast. I see a passenger. Stand, sir, and throw us that you have about ye. Sir, we are undone. These are the villains that all the travelers do fear so much. My friends. That's not so, sir. We are your enemies. Peace, we'll hear him. Aye, by my beard, Willie, for he's a proper man. My riches are these poor habiliments, of which you should here disfurnish me. You take the sum and substance that I have. Whence came you? Uh, from Milan. Have you long sojourned there? Uh, some 16 months and longer might have stayed if crooked fortune had not thwarted me. What? Were you banished thence? I was. For what offense? I killed a man whose death I much repent, but yet I slew him manfully in fight without false vantage or base treachery. Why? Never repent it if it were done so. But were you banished for so small a fault? I was, and held me glad of such a doom. Mm. Tongues? 
My youthful travel therein made me happy, or else I often had been miserable. This fellow were a king for our wild faction. We'll have him. 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 Know then that some of us are gentlemen, such as the fury of ungoverned youth, thrust from the company of awful men. Because you are a banished man, are you content to be our general, to make a virtue of necessity and live as we do in, in this wilderness? I take your offer and will live with you, provided that you do no outrages on silly women or poor passengers. Uh, uh, no, we detest such vile base practices. Come, <clears throat> go with us and we'll bring thee to our cruise and show ye all the treasures we have got, which with ourselves, all rest at thy dispose. Already have I been false to Valentine, and now I must be as unjust to Furio. She twits me with my falsehood to my friend, when to her beauty I commend my vows. She bids me think how I have been forsworn in breaking faith with Julia, whom I loved. Yet, spaniel-like, the more she spurns my love, the more it grows and fawneth on her still. But here comes Thurio. Now must we to her window and give some evening music to her ear. Oh no, Sir Proteus, are you crept before us? Aye, gentle Thurio, for you know that love will creep in service where it cannot go. Aye, but I hope, sir, that you do not love here. Sir, but I do, or else I would be hence. Who, oh, Sylvia? Aye, Sylvia, for your sake. <laughs> I thank you for your own. Uh, now, gentlemen, let's tune it and to it lustily a while. Now, my young guest, I'll bring you where you shall hear music and see the gentleman that you asked for. But shall I hear him speak? Aye, that you shall. Art. Is he among these? Aye, but peace, let's hear him. Sylvia, what is she that all our swains command her? Holy, fair, and wise is she, the heavens such grace did land her, that she might admire it be. That she might admire it be. Is she kind as she is fair? For beauty lives with kindness. Love doth to her eyes repair to help him of his blindness. And being helped in habits there, and being helped in habits there. Oh, then to Sylvia, let us sing, for Sylvia is excelling. She excels each mortal thing upon the dull earth dwelling. To her let us garlands bring, to her let us garlands bring, to her let us garlands bring. Do you, boy? The music likes you not. You mistake. The musician likes me not. 
He plays false, Father, so false he grieves my very heartstrings. But hope doth this serve Podius that we talk on often resort unto this gentlewoman? I tell you what Rance, his man, told me. He loved her out of all Nick. Where is Lance? Gone to seek his dog, which tomorrow, by his master's command, he must carry for a present to his lady. Peace, stand aside, the company parts. Sir Thurio, fear not you. I, I will so plead that you shall say my cunning drift excels. Where meet we? At St. Gregory's Well. Oh, farewell. Madam, good even to your ladyship. I thank you for your music, gentlemen. Who is that that spake? One lady, if you knew his pure heart's truth, you would quickly learn to know him by his voice. Sir Proteus, as I take it. Sir Proteus, gentle lady, and your servant. <clears throat> What's your will? That I may compass yours. You have your wish. My will is even this, that presently you hie you home to bed. Thou subtle, perjured, false, disloyal man, thinkest thou that I am so shallow, so conceitless, to be seduced by thy flattery that hast deceived so many with thy vows? Return, return and make thy love amends, and by and by intend to chide myself, even for this time I spend in talking to thee. Uh, I... Grant, sweet love, that I did love a lady, but she is dead. <laughs> for false, for I'm sure she is not dead. Say that she be, go to thy lady's grave, and call hers thence, or at the least in her sepulchre thine. Madam, if your heart be so obdurate, vouchsafe me the picture that is hanging in your chamber. To that I'll speak, to that I'll sigh and weep. And to your shadow will I make true love. If twere a substance, you would sure deceive it, and make it but a shadow, as am I. I am very loath to be your idol, sir. But since your falsehood shall become you well to worship shadows and adore false shapes, send to me in the morning, and I'll send it, and so good rest. Host, will you go? By my head, am I was fast asleep. Pray you, where lies Sir Podius? At my house. I think it is almost day. Not so, but it hath been the longest night that e'er I watched and the most heaviest. This is the hour that Madame Sylvia entreated me to call and know her mind. There's some great matter she'd employ me in. Uh, madam, Madam. Sir Eglamore, a thousand times good morrow. As many worthy lady to yourself, I am thus early come to know what service it, it is your pleasure to to command me in. Oh, Eglamore, thou art a gentleman. Thou art not ignorant to what dear goodwill I bear unto the banished Valentine, or how my father would enforce me marry vain Thurio, whom my very soul abhors. Sir Eglamore, I would to Valentine to Mantua, where I hear he makes abode, and for the ways are dangerous to pass, I do desire thy worthy company. Go with me. If not, to hide what I have said to thee, that I may venture to depart alone. M Madam, I, I pity much your grievances. I consent to go along with you. When will you go? This evening coming. W where shall I meet you? At Friar Patrick's cell, where I intend holy confession. I will not fail your ladyship. Good morrow. Gentle lady. Good morrow, kind Sir Eglamore. When a man's servant shall play the cur with him, look you, it goes hard. One that I brought up as a puppy, one that I saved from drowning when three or four of his brothers went to it. I have taught him 
even as one would say precisely, thus I would teach a dog. I was sent to deliver him as a present to Mistress Sylvia from my master. And when I took my leave of Madam Sylvia, did not I bid thee mark me and do as I do? Hmm? When didst thou see me heave up my leg and make water against a gentlewoman's farthingale? Hmm? Didst thou see me do such a trick? Hmm? Sebastian is thy name? I like thee well, and will employ thee in some service presently. And what you please, I'll do what I can. I hope thou wilt. How now, you whore-son peasant? Where have you been these two days loitering? Mary, sir, I carried Mistress Sylvia the dog you bade me. She received my dog? No, indeed, did she not? Here have I brought him back again. What? Didst thou offer her this from me? Aye, sir. The other squirrel was stolen from me by the hangman boys in the marketplace. And then I offered her mine own, who is a dog as big as ten of yours, and therefore the gift the greater. Go, get thee hence, and find my dog again, or ne'er return again into my sight. Sebastian, I have entertained thee, partly for tis no trusting the yon foolish lout, but chiefly, if my augury deceive me not, witness good bringing up, fortune, and truth. Therefore, know thou, for this I entertain thee. Go presently and take this ring with thee. Deliver it to Madam Sylvia. She loved me well, delivered it to me. If you love her, not her, to be, to leave her token, she is dead, belike? Mm, not so. I think she lives. Alas. Why dost thou cry, alas? <clears throat> because methinks that she dreams of him that has forgot her love. You dote on her that cares not for your love. And thinking of it makes me cry, alas. Well, uh, give her that ring and therewithal this letter. Uh, uh, that's her chamber. Tell my lady I claim the promise for her heavenly picture. Your message done, hie home unto my chamber where thou shalt find me, sad and solitary. How many women would do such a message? And now am I unhappy messenger? To plead for that which I would not have attained, to carry that which I would have refused, to praise his faith which I would have dispraised. I am my master's true confirmed love, but cannot be true servant to my master unless I, pry, unless I prove false traitor to myself. Yet I will rue for him, but yet so coldly as heaven it knows, I would not have him speed. Good day, gentlewoman. I pray you be my mean to bring me where to speak with Madame Sylvia. What would you with her, if that I be she? If you be she, I do entreat your patience to hear me speak the message from my master, Sir Podius, madam. Oh, he sends you for a picture. Aye, madam. Go give your master this. Tell him from me, one Julia, that his changing thoughts forget, would better fit his chamber than this shadow. Madam, he sends your ladyship this ring. <laughs> More shame for him that he sends it me, for I have heard him say a thousand times his Julia gave it him at his departure. Though his false finger have profaned the ring, mine shall not do his Julia so many wrongs. She thanks you. What say you? <clears throat> I thank you, madam, that you tender her. Dost thou know her? Almost as well as I do myself. To think upon her woes, I do protest that I have wept a hundred several times. She is beholding to thee, gentle youth. Alas, poor lady, desolate and left, I weep myself to think upon thy words. Here, youth, um, where's my purse? I give thee this. 
for thy sweet mistress's sake, because thou lovest her. Farewell. The sun begins to gild the western sky. And now it is about the very hour that Sylvia at Friar Patrick's cell should meet me. Ah, see where she comes. Uh, lady, a happy evening. Amen, amen. Go on, get Aglamore out at the postern by the abbey wall. I fear I am attended by some spies. Oh, fear not. The forest is not three leagues off. If we recover that, we are sure enough. Hmm? So, Proteus, what says Sylvia to my suit? Oh, sir, I find her milder than she was, and yet she takes exceptions at your person. All right, she my discourse. Ill, when you talk of war. But well, when I discourse of love and peace. But better indeed when you hold your peace. What says she to my valor? Oh, sir, she makes no doubt of that. She needs not when she knows it's cowardice. Here comes the duke. How oh, now, Sir Proteus? How oh, now, Thurio? Which of you saw Sir Eglamour of late? Not I. Nor I. Saw you, my daughter? Neither. Why, then she's fled unto the peasant Valentine, and Eglamour is in her company. Therefore, I pray you, stand not to discourse, but mount you presently and meet with me upon the rising of the mountain foot that leads towards Mantua, whither they are fled. Why, this is, if it is to be a peevish girl that flies her fortune when it follows her. I'll after more to be revenged on Eglamour than for the love of reckless Sylvia. And I will follow more for Sylvia's love. And I will follow more to cross that love than hate for Sylvia that has gone for love. Come, come, be patient. We must bring you to our cat. Thousand more mischances than this one have learned me how to brook this patiently. Come, um, bring her away. Where is the gentleman that was with her? Being nimble-footed, he hath outrun us. But Moises and Valerius follow him. There is our captain. We'll follow him that's fled. He cannot escape. Come, I must bring you to our captain's cave. Fear not. He bears an honorable mind and will not use a woman lawlessly. Oh, Valentine, this I endure for thee. How use doth breed a habit in a man? Here can I sit alone, unseen of any, and to the nightingale's complaining notes tune my distress and record my woes. Repair me with thy presence, Sylvia, thou gentle nymph. Cherish thy forlorn swain. What, what hallowing and what stir is this today? These are my mates that have some unhappy passenger in chase. I have much to do to keep them from out civil outrages. Who's this comes here? This service I have done for you to hazard life and rescue you from him that would have forced your honor and your love, vouchsafe me for my meed, but one fair look. How like a dream is this I see and hear? Oh, miserable, unhappy that I am. Uh, unhappy were you, madam, ere I came. Had I been seized by a hungry lion, I would have been a breakfast to the beast rather than have false Proteus rescue me. Oh, heaven be the judge how I love Valentine, whose life's as, as tender to me as my soul. I do detest false, perjured Proteus, read over Julia's heart, thy first, best love, for whose dear sake thou didst then rend thy faith into a thousand oaths to love me. 
Thou hast no faith left now, thou counterfeit to thy true friend. In love, who respects friend? All men but Proteus. Nay, if the gentle spirit of moving words can no way change you to a milder form, I'll woo you like a soldier and force ye. Oh, heaven. I'll force thee yield to my desire. Ruffian, let go that rude, uncivil touch, thou friend of an ill fashion. Valentine? <sighs> Thou treacherous man, not but mine eye could have persuaded me. Now I dare not say I have one friend alive when one's own right hand is perjured to the bosom. Proteus, I'm sorry, I must never trust thee more. Oh, time most accursed amongst all foes that a friend should be the worst. Shame and guilt confounds me. Love is my sin, and thy dear virtue hate, hate of my sin, grounded on sinful loving. <sighs> but with mine compare thou thine own state, and thou shalt find it merits not reproving, or, if it do, not from those lips of thine that have sealed false bonds as oft as mine. Forgive me. Valentine, be it lawful that I love thee, as thou lovest those whom thin eyes woo as mine importune thee. Root pity in thy heart, and if hearty sorrow be a sufficient ransom for offense, I tender it here. I do as truly suffer as e'er I did commit. Then I am paid. By penitence, the eternal's wrath's appeased, and that my love may appear plain and free. All that was mine in Sylvia, I give thee. Oh, me unhappy. Why, boy, what's the matter? Look up, speak. Oh, good sir. My master charged me to deliver a ring to, to Madame Sylvia, which, had of my neglect, was never done. Where is that ring, boy? Here, tis. This is it. Why, this is the ring I gave to Julia. Oh, I miss. I have mistook. This is the ring you sent to Sylvia. Oh, but how camest thou by this ring? At my depart, I gave this unto Julia. And Julia herself did give it me. And Julia herself hath brought it hither. How, Julia? Behold her that gave aim to all thy oaths, and enter the, entertained them deeply in her heart. How oft hast thou with perjury cleft the root? Oh, odious, let this habit make thee blush. Be thou ashamed that I have took upon me such an immodest remnant. It is the lesser blot modesty finds, that women, women to change their shapes than men their minds. <laughs> Men their minds, tis true. That one error fills him with faults, makes him run through all the sins. Inconstancy falls off ere it begins. What is in Sylvia's face? But I may spy more fresh in Julia's with a constant eye. Come, come, a hand from either. Let me be blessed to make this happy close. For pity to such friends should be long foes. Bear witness, heaven. I have my wish forever. And I mine. Prize! <laughs> Prize! <laughs> Prize. Forbear, forbear, I say, it is my lord the duke. Your grace is welcome to a man disgraced, banished, Valentine. Sir, Valentine? Yonder is Sylvia, and Sylvia's mine. Furio, give back or else embrace thy death. Come not within the measure of my wrath. I dare thee but to breathe upon my love. I suppose him but a fool that will endanger his body for a girl that loves him not. I claim her not, and therefore she is thine. By the honor of my ancestry, I do applaud thy spirit, Valentine. Know then, 
I here forget all former griefs. Cancel all grudge. Repeal thee home again, Sir Valentine. Thou art a gentleman and well derived. Take thou thy Sylvia, for thou hast deserved her. I thank your grace. The gift hath made me happy. I now beseech you for your daughter's sake to grant one boom that I shall ask of you. I grant it for thine own, whate'er it be. These banished men that I have kept with all are men endued with worthy qualities. Forgive them what they have committed here and let them be recalled from their exile. Thou hast prevailed. I pardon them and thee. Come, let us go. We will include all jars with triumphs, mirth, and rare solemnity. And as we walk along, I dare be bold with our discourse to make your grace to smile. What think you of this page, my lord? I think the boy hath grace in him. Uh, he blushes. I warrant you, my lord, more grace than boy. What mean you by that saying? Please you, I'll tell you as we pass along that you will wonder what hath fortuned. Come, Proteus, tis your penance, but to hear the story of your loves discovered. That done, our day of marriage shall be yours. One feast, one house, one mutual happiness.